Douglas Murray is a British author and political commentator and self-proclaimed Christian atheist. He went from studying English at Oxford and publishing books like Bozy, a biography of Lord Alfred Douglas, to speaking about subjects he has no academic background in and is frankly ignorant about, like Islam and theology in general. He had a conversation with John Anderson about the impact of Christianity and Islam on the West. And let's say he showed that he is not knowledgeable about both Islam and Christianity. So without wasting any time, let's watch the clips and come back. What is one of the greatest moments in Christian scripture, but the moment when Jesus has brought to him the woman who is caught in adultery. And what does Jesus say when the crowd wants to stone her for her sins? He says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And the crowd go away. Let me break it to you and anybody who believes in this story. The verses mentioning the story of the adulterous woman are a corruption and a later addition to the text. John 8 verse 7 When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. This is supposed to be Jesus refusing to stone the adulterous woman. But the verse is a later addition to the text. This is my Bible and this is the NIV version. And it says before the beginning of John chapter 8, the earliest and most reliable manuscripts do not have John 7 verse 53 to John 8 verse 11, meaning that the verse about the adulterous woman is a fabrication. Bart Ehrman, who is an American New Testament scholar, he wrote in his blog an article titled The Woman Taken in Adultery in the King James Version. And he says, In fact, even though it is technically true that the passage probably does not belong in the New Testament, the reality is that it is not a debated point among textual scholars and translators. The passage was not part of the Gospel of John originally, or any other Gospel. People know it so well principally because it appeared in the KJV. I know why he tried to bring this story to praise Jesus of Christianity. It is to try to put doubt in the character of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Islam. Let's hear him before I respond. Now, in the Islamic tradition, a very, very similar thing happens when a woman is brought to Muhammad and he has her stoned. So, history of Christianity, more bloody or less bloody if Jesus was more like Muhammad? I think everyone would say, likely to be more bloody. Here you go. Again, the same misconceptions, lies, and distortions of the truth. Before I respond to his claim about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let's put to bed the concept of a passive, lovely Jesus in the Bible. As I already mentioned, the story of the adulterous woman in the Bible is false. So to use it as evidence is a non sequitur. This is the true lovely Jesus of the Bible. Matthew 15 verse 3 to 4. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition for God said honor your father and mother and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to that Jesus in the New Testament is ordering the Jewish people to keep the punishment of the one who curses their mother or father this is the true Jesus not the passive hippie caricature that the liberals are trying to create now let's respond to the story of the woman that came to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam demanding to be punished for adultery yes she came to the prophet she confessed and she was the one who demanded to be punished why they always hide this simple fact there came to him the holy prophet a woman from ghamid and said allah's messenger i have committed adultery so purify me he the holy prophet turned her away on the following day she said allah's messenger why do you turn me away perhaps you turn me away as you turned away ma'iz why did prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turn her away the first time if he was as you claim a bloodthirsty person and he turned her away about three times until her child grew old enough and she weaned him. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pronounced the punishment. And this is what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about her. Thereupon he the Holy Prophet said, Khalid, 
be gentle. By him in whose hand is my life. She has made such a repentance that even if a wrongful tax collector were to repent, he would have been forgiven. Then giving command regarding her, he prayed over her and she was buried. Alhamdulillah, we are proud of every single command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, Christians believe that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament and he is the one who revealed this verse. Deuteronomy 22 verse 22. If a man is found sleeping sleeping with another man's wife. Both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. This is the reality of Christianity. So for an atheist to somehow try to defend Christianity in comparison to Islam doesn't make any sense, but only shows a lack of understanding of theology and divine command theory. Islam is about subjugation to Allah. And uh, that's why one of the reasons why the Muslim world is as it is. The Christian world is, is as it is because of the legacy of Christianity. I mean, it's, it's from Christianity that we get the idea of rights. What is he talking about? Let's start with the simple legal concept of the presumption of innocence. In the Hebrew Bible, there is something called the ordeal of the bitter water, meaning that if a man suspects his wife is not faithful and wants to put her to the test, she is to be judged without evidence. The jealousy and paranoia of the husband is enough. The ordeal consisted of the wife having to drink a specific portion administered by the priest. If the woman was unharmed by the bitter water, the rules regard her as innocent of the accusation. The account in the book of Numbers states that the man shall be free from blame. So according to the Bible, the woman is judged without any evidence and it is upon her to prove her innocence by surviving the bitter water curse. This is unjust and a humiliating ritual towards women. There is no such thing in Islam. We believe in justice and everyone is presumed innocent according to Islam. That's why Harvard Law School has this verse from the Quran written on one of its walls. All you have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents or relatives, whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. So follow not personal inclination, lest you not be just. And if you distort your testimony or refuse to give it, then indeed Allah is ever with what you do acquainted. This is what Islam teaches, but you will ignore this and only focus on the last century of Islam, ignoring more than 1400 years of Islamic civilization. Let's see who promotes scientific discovery, Islam or Christianity. According to history.com, Galileo is accused of heresy. On April 12, 1633, Chief Inquisitor Father Vincenzo Maculani da Firenzuola, appointed by Pope Urban VIII, begins the accusation of physicists and astronomer Galileo Galilei, Galileo was ordered to turn himself into the holy office to begin trial for holding the belief that the earth revolves around the sun, which was deemed heretical by the Catholic Church. Standard practice demanded that the accused be imprisoned and secluded during the trial. This is the real history of Christianity and the fact that you are able to do algorithm and algebra is because of Islam and Islamic civilization. Algebra for example is an Arab Arabic word Al-Jabr thanks to the Muslim mathematician Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khawarizmi who was a Muslim polymath who produced vastly influential works in mathematics, astronomy and geography and without his contribution you probably wouldn't be able to record this video to speak against the Islamic civilization and many other Muslim scientists like Ibn al-Haytham, Jabir ibn Hayyan, Ibn Rajd and many others contributed to the development of science and the scientific renaissance in Europe. In medieval times, intellectually prosperous Islamic civilization passed works on natural philosophy in Arabic to Western Europe, giving the first impetus to the rise of the new form of intellectual inquiry in Europe. The result was not only a transformation in the structure of European universities, but also the establishment of a new form of doctrine, based on incorporating Arabic Aristotelian works into the new Thomist theology. For over for two centuries, up to the 15th century, Latin translation of the Arabic philosophical corpus played a key role in the curricula of European intellectual institutions. Without Muslim civilization and the Islamic golden age, you would never have the Renaissance in Europe. So be grateful and say thank you.
Thank you. This is just a simple response to the contribution of Islam and Muslims to science. Please let me know if you would be interested in a separate video only about Muslim scientists and their influence in the science of today and the West. I hope you benefited from this video. You can also watch this video about a Jewish rabbi claiming the Quran is wrong about the Torah. And don't forget to subscribe for daily uploads. Thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum.